with all the stuff that the Noble Foundation does, a lot of times it gets missed that the Noble Foundation is a producer. We have our own properties we, um, that we own and operate. Those properties consist of seven ranches, the biggest one being around 5,300 acres, the smallest one being 200 acres. Um, at any given point in time of the year, we'll have cattle on those ranches. And so that right there should tell you that um, pretty diverse operation with lots of cattle moving around. Um, total acres is approximately 14,000 acres. Probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 8,500 of those acres are grazable. Those farms um, span across three counties. And so again, lots of, lots of cattle movement, especially when we're in terms of getting these cattle to research projects and demonstration projects. And then we have also introduced native and annual forages. And so again, we spend a lot of time talking about how we mo most efficiently utilize those, those properties. So in terms of cattle inventory, last year, I'm gonna give you 2016's inventory. Last year, we bred over 500 uh, females. So you can see there that we've got close to 275 mature females and the rest of them being first calf heifers and, and uh, exposed heifers. So um, 2016 would go on record in terms of overall numbers as being the largest in history. So we had two relatively large stalker projects. One of those won't be continued this year. But you can see there we had over 700 head that we were conducting research on. And all this is tied into the idea that being able to record the data and being able to make sure that we maintain their individual identification as a part of this, uh, this research project and the building of a database. But in terms of an overall management plan, we've adopted the Integrity Beef Program. And so whenever we talk about the three pillars of sustainability, it's encapsulated in this program. So we jump into identification and record keeping. There's a lot of movement, cattle movement. And so we spend a lot of time thinking and talking about how do we make sure that we maintain the integrity of the individual identification as well as the data that's being collected that's associated with those individuals. And so, um, you know, last year, like I said, we bred close to 500 cows. Um, only less than 5% didn't get put on a research project. And so about a year and a half ago, we went through the process of how do we identify these cattle. You can see there that those are the tags that we're using. Uh, we're fixing to tag some um, uh, second calf heifers, but we've also got the EID reader. And so all of our cattle have, all of our mature cows anyway, have three ways of, of identification. So we've got an EID, we've got a dangle tag, and then we've got the brucellosis or the calf hood vaccination that we're keeping in a database. So here's a picture of a six-year-old cow or a coming six-year-old cow. The reason why that I can say that is that first digit there on that cow's tag is, an, is correlated with a, uh, a year. So that cow there was born in 2011. So you can get a pretty good idea of how we tag our, ca our cows and our calves. So uh, you can see there that that calf is, that nursing calf has got a 15 on top with a Y202. And so we know in our databases, we record that calf's information across his, his, his entire life. We know that that is Y202's calf that was born in 2015. So like I said, the reason why I know that that's a six-year-old cow or a coming six-year-old cow, this is, this is her calf's, this is her last year's calf, and so she was five years old. But that Y corresponds with uh, 2011, so that's a Beef Improvement Federation um, approved uh, numbers, numbering system. And so basically, if you're incorporating that tagging system, all Ys across the entire United States are going to be born in 2011. And the reason why we went with that is because it allows us to expand, and it also allows us to only put uh, four digits on that tag, so it allows a, a little bit more visibility. Here's would be a, st a stalker tag. Um, you can see there that uh, the 15 is in the top of, is the top of the tag. As the calves come to the weaning pen, we'll give them a stalker tag because uh, most all of our raised calves go on to a research project. Identification equals decision making. We refer to ourselves as researchers, but we're also producers as well. And so we're collecting not just research data, but we're collecting operational data as well. And we're also collecting data that coincides with some of our uh, accounting needs and the fact that we need to make sure that we are able to track those cattle on a monthly basis. So seven farms 
um, lots of different research projects, lots of different demonstration projects, being able to make sure that we're able to maintain the integrity of the research data as well as track those cattle across the seven different farms. It's important to make sure that we have as many forms of permanent identification as possible. The dangle tag there that you see has also got a ultra high frequency chip in it. So the ultra high frequency chip is a, a is, it's available, but it's probably not ready to be put out there, you know, in terms of, of mass usage. But the, the thing that's different about the ultra high frequency technology as opposed to the low frequency is the read range. So you're able to extend the read range considerably with the ultra high frequency. And so think about a barcode reader at Walmart. It's essentially the same technology. The EID that you see in that calf series, the old low, low, low frequency tag, and so you've got to have been relatively short distance away from that animal to be able to read that tag. And then again, we're on all the, the first calf heifers, or all the heifer calves, we're able to um, sequentially number the brucellosis tags as well. So we've got three forms of identification on, our, on all our mature cows. Jumping into some pr production metrics, I mean, we keep calving records on all, the, on all the cows, and the reason why we do that is so that we can look at data like this. We know that, uh, you know, in terms of longevity of your cow herd, it's very important to get those cows calving in the first 21 days, and so you don't know that unless you're keeping those records. We did a pretty good job with those first calf heifers there. We got 50, almost 55% of those heifers calving in the first 21 days. The cow herd spread out a little bit, but uh, part of that is because we're dealing with some, some older cows as well as we backed up those cows 15 days. And so the data is important within a year, but it's, it's probably more important as you stack years. And so it's gonna be really interesting we're calving right now. So it's gonna be really interesting to see how this evolves over time and see whether or not we can back up you know, these cows is, is in terms of uh, uh, calving intervals. I'm not a proponent of a commercial producer collecting birth weights, but I show this because it's, I think it's important because it shows two things. One, we've all heard the old adage, there's as much variation within breed as there is across breeds. And so you're gonna get extremes no matter what breed you're working with. And so it's very important to make sure that you identify whether or not you've got one of those extremes on either side. And so which leads me into the second point, which is, um, you know, for those of you that are not selecting your bulls based on EPDs, I would strongly encourage you to do that. Because this is, this is a, we went to uh, using Charlotte bulls and he Hereford bulls last year, and this is, or two years ago, and this is a result in calf crop. And so if I was to tell you we're using Angus, Hereford, Charlotte bulls, I think probably most of you would think that in terms of low birth weight to high birth weight, they would probably rank in that order. And that's not the case. And so... We didn't have any issues whatsoever in, in terms of dystocia, but we did see a considerably higher birth weight, actual birth weights for the Hereford bulls as opposed to the Charlet or the Angus. And so, you know, like I said, we didn't have any dystocia issues, but the fact that we're keeping these records allows us to use this information in terms of assigning, you know, those, those bulls um, to future cow herds. So um, I don't know that you would you would necessarily think that that would, that would be the true, but that true, but that's that's the actual. And so EPDs are a great way to select bulls, but you know they're just a number. And so having some of this actual information allows us to look at it and and be be better managers. We do use a artificial insemination program. We've been doing that now for a, for a long time. We did change things up this last year. Um, we're starting to use AI as the a, um, artificial insemination sire, um, and then we're using Charlet bulls to clean those those cows up. I'm showing you here the selection criteria that we went through in terms of selecting those those AI sires. And the main point here is is not that you should be following our protocol. What I'm trying to show here is is that we started off with 300 potential sires, or almost 300 potential sires. And it's really not that hard to go in and, and gather this information. You just go to the website or you call your, your stud provider and, and have them provide you with the electronic database. But I started off with, I think there's 291 potential sires there in a spreadsheet, and I just started hacking on them based on our prioritized list of characteristics or traits for selection. So I show there you know, some of the considerations that we made. We try to put ourselves in a commercial producer's mindset because again, I'm not promoting a pedigree. 
I'm promoting a process. And so the artificial insemination is a technology that's available, but we find that a lot of commercial producers don't utilize it. So with, with access to more bulls as well as the opportunity to synchronize and use a timed AI event, we think that it's an opportunity to really use our cow herd to, to help leverage and, and, and promote a potential technology that will help you as commercial cattle producers. So I started with 291. I came down to basically seven, and the last cut was accuracy. And so we, we really tried to, to select proven bulls. And so I show this to show you that the green highlighted uh, boxes there are accuracies above 0.5, and so relatively proven bulls. But I show also here to the left side, I've got my comments down at the bottom, but I show also just because they're in a catalog doesn't necessarily mean that they're viable in terms of utilizing as a, as a, from a commercial perspective. Because we, like I said, we were going to breed close to 500 cows, and there was only three of those seven bulls that were actually, there was enough semen in tanks that made them viable choices. And so, again, as we think about this from a commercial producer's perspective, you got to make sure that there's enough semen out there in order to, to service your, your cows. And so that's a definitely a consideration. I mean, that one bull there is two weeks out for collection. So he was obviously not a viable choice. I'm going to show these two bulls, not, again, not, not because I'm promoting them or promoting their pedigree, but we used two bulls because they were both selected based on the same process. And so they fleshed out <clears throat> in terms of their access to semen as well as in terms of what they brought to the table, <clears throat> excuse me, for us as, as a producer. And so um, the reason why we used two is because I wanted to make sure that we're also measuring the variation within those two. So there's a sensitivity analysis between the price of semen and your viability to commercial production. So we want to make sure we had a backup plan. So there's the protege bull, there's the 10X bull, and here's the resulting calf crop. Now we got a little bit behind last year because we used Charlie bull for the AI sire, but this year we've actually got the Angus bull for the AI sire and the Charlie bulls for cleanups. And so what, what we hope that, that to do is to get dual calf crops out of the same calving season with those, those heifer calves being born earlier in, this, in the year being um, or earlier in the calving season being those that we're going to select for heifers and in those charlet calves that are being born late in the year you know you're, you've got the higher performance your your more paternal genetics that are allowing them to increase the weight per day of age and so at the end of the year we want to be able to wean a, a relatively uniform calf crop so with that my time's up